Also, hi, Diane, Sarana, and everyone else we can't see. Yes, yes, yes. And welcome everyone in this room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Well of Being Wednesday. I'm Eve, and yeah. So I, I would say so delighted, but I think I'm so humbled <laughs> to be with you tonight in terms of the topic that we're going to be covering um, in reading and preparing for tonight. I just had that sense of um, how deeply I need to really take these teachings to heart and for them to feel very real and resonant for me and to kind of like light a fire. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term that there's a, a way when our longing to awaken becomes greater than almost anything in our life, then we want to practice as though our hair were on fire. I'm like, I'm not sure how much practice would help if my hair was <laughs> But I, I think there's an idea of like, how can we ignite such a great um, desire? And, you know, with heavy heart, there's so much support around the world for us to do this work, right? Um, some of you who have been coming know that the very purpose of this text, this 8th century text with commentary by Pema Chodron is how do we find ourselves to be true warriors of compassion within a world that is on fire? And how do we keep ourselves open? How do we keep our ability to care for others open as the stress and the stress and the stress continues? Not that this is new, right? There are many systems of stress and oppression that have been with us all of our lifetimes. And yet our immediate global access to the suffering of the world and increasingly makes these teachings ever more important um, and, and, and necessary. Doesn't make the simple instruction for what needs to be done any easier. Because the simple instructions to become a bodhisattva or a warrior of compassion are we have to really train the mind to become flexible and pliant. So not, as is described in the text, a wild elephant that is roaming about. So to train our mind that we can actually tether it with our mindfulness and come back, come back, not be carried away into kind of fantasy and anxiety. And that also we're able, and, and maybe as a result of that training, to break down any barriers we have in our heart of compassion so that our compassion would shine like the sun shines equally on everything. Like that kind of compassion. No big deal, right? We got this. <laughs> we got an hour and a half. <laughs> um, it's so daunting and it's so, you know, needed. And um, even Coco knows that here, <laughs> our Dharma dog. And yeah, tonight we're going to actually focus in specifically on craving. And as promised uh, from last week, because we didn't get there, I have to get the quote right because it's so good. On the full blown hell of insatiable desire. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's got a ring to it, <laughs> and I, you know, and, and to feel it. And often we think desire and we think, you know, that's when we are, you know, wanting after something that's really desirable and good. But part of this craving is that, you know, we are constantly reinforcing also habits that don't feel good. Anxiety and worry you know, our fixation on what's wrong. That's also part of deeply understanding kind of the cycle of craving. And for the last two weeks, we focused on this Vedana practice, or this practice of really exploring at the momentary level when something feels pleasant or unpleasant, or neutral, in between. And exploring that in our bodies, in our experiences through all the sense portals and our mind, thoughts we have as a way to really start kind of tethering that, that elephant of the mind and to recognize when the mind is wandering and what is the kind of charge when the mind is wandering, that pleasant, unpleasant, or just 
missing completely what's happening. And that form of like attentiveness, like really paying attention of where is the mind going and kind of what's the story it's creating upon our sensory experience. Welcome. And tonight we're gonna kind of again look at this similar, I would say, skill that's needed of really knowing and being able to feel and sense what's happening in the context of our emotions. But we're gonna do so with probably one of my all-time favorite practices. Many of you have done this here with me and also if you're fortunate with Sophie Rinpoche. And this is a teaching called the handshake practice, the handshake with emotion. And when I was thinking about um, tonight and some of the, the passages and reading of how we develop these spiritual qualities that are called paramitas, to work with this wild elephant of the mind, what we really need to do is, you know, start to cultivate this ability to tolerate the distress of being with something that feels bad or negative, unpleasant. Something with that Vedana charge of, I don't like and with handshake practice, one thing we can do, so we kind of bring to mind, we prime the pump with handshake practice of thinking of an experience. Often I use anger, because many of us are familiar with the imprint of anger in the body, and that's something we can call forth. But tonight, I'd like us to work with stress, air quotes. Uh -huh. uh, and I use the air quotes because stress means so many things. And we can um, talk about that in a nerdy way later if that's needed. But really, you know, thinking of stress as when we get caught up and fixated in the future with worry. Anybody have that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our stress is really, it's anxiety and fixation upon something in the future that we're, that's gonna go wrong, that's gonna be bad. And you know, this humble animal um, being that we are, we are reacting to this potential future threat at a very similar level than an actual immediate in this moment threat, right? Those are not so different for our nervous system. So when we think about these kind of stresses we also have to get honest that like we're kind of like hooked on them, right? Like there's, even though it doesn't feel good, it feels productive when we're being stressed, right? Like what's happening? Oh God, what's wrong? What might be wrong in the future? Like there's a, such a tendency. And when we think about, it's, it's really hard for us to kind of catch ourselves in the moment of when we, really succumb to that habit of stress, anxiety, and rumination. So with this practice of handshake, what we're going to do is actually invite in something that we're worried about that feels stressful for us. That could be personal, that could be on the world stage. There's a lot of material. I'm sure if no one has an example, someone can offer you one, something to worry worried about. Um, and we're gonna bring forth that worry you know, just long enough to recognize this doesn't feel good, right? As a, as a mental experience. And then when we release the thought, which is hard to do, but we can do it over and over, release the thought of the worry. So um, I'm trying to think of a worry. So many good ones right now. Um, let's see. I am worried about what's going to happen in this election, right? That's one thing I'm worried about. And I can, there's so much good material there, right? There's so many angles for me to, to get into. But when I release the thought pattern, that's actually not happening right now, right? So there's a possibility to release the thought and then just work with the imprint in the body of what worry feels like. And that's handshake practice learning to release the thought, which is kind of what traps us into these ongoing perpetual states of uh, desire and aversion, and just feel the sensation in the body. And kind of learn how to watch the sensation shift, a change, dissipate. That's what it will naturally do. 
So the experience of these difficult or high charged emotion, emotions called kleshas in Tibetan, these will only kind of continue if we continue to fuel them. And in next chapter, Shantideva has one of my favorite lines of thinking about your emotions is essentially like fuel on the fire. Like you're only going to exacerbate them. So it can be released and then drop into the body. Drop into the body and notice the shift and change. So we're actually using our body as a refuge and moving from what might feel pretty negative or difficult into something that feels maybe neutral. And then where we're headed, sneak preview, is that there is not just the body as a refuge away from what's hard, but the body and you know, this being as somewhere that's always already good. Like that our natural state of awareness and being is already good. And to be able to feel that in practice, like slowly over time, slowly, slowly over time, we remember that. I know there's a lot of dedicated practitioners in this room. And, you know, maybe nine out of 10 times we get stressed out and we go to our natural habits, right? Distraction, many forms, avoiding, suppressing, but maybe one out of those 10 times we remember to just like go behind, you know, the, the curtain, the kind of obscuration of difficult feelings and emotions, rest in awareness. So that's what we're kind of preparing for. That's the practice we're going to do. Exciting. One of my favorites, and I was mentioning how I find Vedana usually really a boring practice, so I think this one is the opposite. It's, it's hard. It's not boring because we're inviting in sensations in the body that usually we try to avoid or deny. I would like to give us some, um, you know, stress-informed, trauma-informed options, especially if the body doesn't feel like the right place to focus on. Uh, we can also do, you know, a grounding in our breath, focusing on just one area. Um, so for folks who are new to the practice, it's really good to pick something we feel stressed about at a reasonable level, like there's some juice, but not something that's stressful, like that is actually life-threatening in this moment. That's not a great thing to practice with in this meditation. It might be at another time, another, but like, you know, so can I, can we get some examples? What, what are folks gonna practice with here? What kind of stress comes to mind? What's a mid-range stress you'd like to bring forth to then release? Yes, Jimmy. We've got a new house mate moving into our home. There we go. And our 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 old house mate was someone who was living there for close to eight years now. Mm. And she's really good. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. So she's great. Yeah. You know. But we've got someone else and we're gonna see how they work out. Yeah. But it's stressful. Yeah, I can see. yeah, that's your home. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? What's the stress? Yes, Lucas. Do I need the microphone? Yeah, we yes. can pass to you. I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm negotiating down my rent with my landlord, um, <laughs> while also moving into a studio and workshop, and <laughs> every every dollar. Feels them. Yes, there we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And like this is, you know, like prime material of like wake up in the night, right? It's like that when we're so vulnerable and it's right there. <clears throat> yeah. But it's better than having a boss. Hey, I'm with you. <laughs> My fellow unemployed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe one more just to kind of get a feel. Oh, yeah. I see Elizabeth. Hi there. Hey. Um, You're moving too. Yeah. I am. Everything's coming up moving right now with all the people talking. Um, yeah. Finishing packing on time for, for pickup of the U box. Yeah. <laughs> like not life threatening, but super stressful. Oh, yeah. And the, we can talk about this a little more after, but 
you know, what really gets us hooked into some of these fixations is not just literally if I don't have the stuff packed up, it won't get in the box and then what do I do? There's these other stories, right, that are right beneath it like, I can't do this, like I'm not good at, like I always, why is there no one here to help me, right? There's other, um, oh that's so things, true, right, in our database, right, that yeah. are going to make a charge, so. And with that, when we release, with Handshake, when we release, we really get to feel like this moment of what if I wasn't so tied into this identity story of who I am and who I'm not. And I could just feel this emotion as a passing feeling wave. So that's, we'll try it, at the very least. No need to succeed, but we'll give it a try. So let's find a supportive posture for our practice. Okay. And take a moment, we're still in this equinox week, just feeling a sense of being in this place, in this space, in this time, in this season. Feeling the ways the body may already be responding to the darker evenings and mornings. those of us in the room really feeling a sense of being here in this room with other beings. And for friends online, feeling this virtual space of shared togetherness while in the comfort of what is likely our own home. feel and imagine an unburdening of whatever we carried into this room at this time. At this moment, we're supported, connected, and free. And as the bell rings to open the practice, Feel and imagine as much as possible shedding everything other than this moment and this breath. And with kindness, noticing how the mind immediately leaps away, finding itself compulsively drawn to a thought or memory or image, and very gently and kindly returning attention awareness to the breath and the body. And every time our mind is returning, you can imagine that that energy which pops up, pulls us away, is returned to be energy that enlivens our practice of being here. We may feel tired or in the residue of some emotion, and yet that kind of core energy of the mind, that 
brightness is here. Let's redirect it to being present with the breath and the body every single time we get carried away. For a couple moments, allowing all of our sense doors to receive, so noticing the sounds that arise and fall, noticing the sensations coming and going. If there's any scent or taste, maybe even the play of light behind closed eyes a very gentle and soft awareness, just following with mindfulness, everything arising through the senses. And gently narrowing and shifting the focus just to the body. It's such a rich territory of sensations, subtle energies and movements, allowing attention and awareness to be freely experienced throughout the body. Maybe there's a tightness at the shoulder or some sort of warmth in the chest. So we don't need to deliberately go through every part of the body. Just this kind of watchfulness of noticing sensations throughout the body. One layer beneath the 
or physical tactile sensations is this subtle body, this way in which we might be able to notice emotional residue, maybe areas that feel blocked or heavy, light, expansive. Bring curiosity and this open attention and awareness to the experience of the body at this more subtle level. What is the sensation or feelings around the eyes? around the jaw and the neck. And the chest and belly. So important to this practice as we prepare for the handshake is to have no agenda we're not trying to fix or change what we discover as sensations in the body. Just this gentle curiosity, being with the sensations which are here. And it keeps changing. Sensations shift and move. So we can keep noticing, refreshing this experience of knowing and feeling the body from within the body. Now we deliberately shift our attention and awareness to the mind, to imagination and memory. And bringing to the forefront of our mind something that we experience as stressful in our life, in the world. And there could be many things, but just try to focus on one thing. Maybe an image arises or a scene, maybe words. And for a little bit, in order for us to really capture the essence and experience of the stress, we allow ourselves to really dig into what is it that we feel this stress about? Who else is involved with anyone? What are the worries, fears, considerations? Notice how this feels in the body. Notice at a general or specific level, is there contraction? What energies might be arising? Really attend closely to the mind in stress, the body in stress, the heart in stress. 
if it feels just conceptual, it isn't landing, no problem. Spend a bit longer making real this concern or consideration. So a bit different than just being lost in fixation and stress. We are noticing fixation and stress in the body, the heart and the mind. And then as though releasing a helium balloon, can we just release the story? The catastrophizing the worry, and drop all of our attention and awareness just to the body. Noting and feeling the impact of how bringing stress impacts the body. Again, without agenda, just curiosity. What are the sensations in the body now? feel and imagine as though there were enough space for all of these sensations in the body. Notice when the mind gets distracted. Maybe it wants to carry on with the stress story or exit, distract, go somewhere else. And just keep returning, dropping attention and awareness fully into the body. And noticing how the sensations in the body may shift and change, unwind or dissipate. As we shake hands with these sensations, we meet them as they are, not trying to push them away, not trying to overly embrace, just that simple handshake, our attention and awareness with what is here, just as it is. It either feels too uncomfortable in the body. We can gently open the eyes, place a hand on the heart, focus on the breath.
And let the sensations start to dissipate and shift. Bring curiosity to what the experience is of this curious, kind awareness. It's noticing the bottom. So slightly shifting from the awareness of sensations in the body to simply awareness, that quality of kind curiosity. without an expectation for this to be so. Notice, possibly, is there something that feels pleasant or just okay? Just a simple sense of goodness or okayness being with our attention and awareness in the body, but also greater than the body. Every time the mind gets carried away, notice what happens in the body. Do you lose the body? Does the mind become contracted? What is the quality of getting swept up and carried away? And then returning. Noticing awareness, noticing awareness of the body. invitation, if it feels natural, for awareness to simply be aware, not a noticing. It's this presence of awareness, this knowing.
this knowing awareness isn't a void or an abyss, it's simply the ground from which all other noticing and attention comes forth. The sensations still arise, the sounds still come. For just a couple more moments, seeing if we can experience this sense of resting in awareness, and whether there is a quality within this resting in awareness that feels good or okay. A sense of pleasantness without fixating on pleasantness. A sense of pleasantness without any direct target or trigger. When the bell rings, seeing if you can maintain and sustain a sense of awareness and embodied awareness, basic goodness. Thank you for your practice. Anybody think they are going to come to the Dharma Collective in order to get stressed out tonight? It's like a plot twist. Uh, yeah. It um, can be, as I mentioned, this word so humbling to kind of see and feel and know the stressed mind, to really kind of feel it capture us, to feel that contraction. And, um, can anybody in this room have a hard time letting go of the stress story? Once I was like, oh, be in the body a little bit. Yes. Yeah. What does he say? My limb, my limbless enemies with no faculties. These are the greatest enemies of mine. Right? Mm -hmm. Just these ruminative, um, difficult emotional states. They are so much more powerful than you know, any enemy in our natural world because they follow us everywhere. They know where we always are inside of our own mind. Yeah, I would love to hear if anyone had a, a question or a reflection. And again, pithy, given our group size. Digest or compost in that way, which is so good. How do you 
sometimes things like I had one today that's so stressful that I just am numb. Mm -hmm. There's no feeling in the body to feel into. So how do you mm -hmm. that? There's just the thought. Um there's knowledge of a situation that makes me just freeze, I guess. So that maybe there's a so maybe there's a little bit of like a frozen feeling, yes. but you know that there's seventy five other stronger emotions that are frozen up. That's so interesting, you know, and Many years of teaching this, no one has ever brought this up, but it makes perfect sense, right? That, you know, we could have this kind of overwhelm and distress, but we could also hit that kind of frozen place. And um, I'll have to just go with the instructions of my, my root teacher, Alan Wallace, who always says, whenever you come up with something in meditation that's hard to understand and know how to be with, relax. And generally, he's right, because a lot of it is, you know, the mind is tight, right? And, and in this case, the mind is like, it's kind of bearing down on our ability to, to feel, um, which is so, yeah, it's so interesting. And the relaxing, and the rela like the relaxing in the body and the relaxing in the body will likely kind of start to soften that experience of the kind of clamping down. Because it's, it's interesting, too, that there's not a lot of thought content. And it's not ruminative. It's like, um, you have thought of the situation and you just go somewhere else to think about it either. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also a really, you know, powerfully subtle practice to see the mind in denial. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so much more familiar with the mind in rumination. But of course, denial is like a huge strategy. And our callousness towards what's happening is a denial, right? Like we can kind of create callous, like just can't, not my problem, not my thing, like that kind of pushing away, we do it all the time. It's a difficult material, but to actually feel it, right, is something, uh, yeah, to be so gentle with, right? There's no forcing, forcing doesn't work. So it is that, you know, not relaxation, like lay down and light a candle, but like that existential relaxation. Um, almost like a cueing, which is what the nervous system in that state would need, a cueing of safety. Like, I'm okay. I can be here. And then maybe the, the other content will allow itself to be revealed so that it can unwind. Yeah. Thanks so much, Vicky. I had feelings that were very interesting. So I had something that I was stressed about. I let it go. And then it just like kept just like I kept getting distracted by other stressors. <laughs> I don't think, no, no, I need to focus on this stressor. <laughs> <laughs> I go to that one. And so, it, yeah, when you said like the mind wants to be distracting, it's not, I don't know if you've had that experience before, but it was very interesting. I tried to pull myself to the right structure. Yeah. <laughs> this brings me to, I, I love this okay. phrase. I, I said, um, Alan Wallace before, who's like a, he's my, really my first teacher, and he came up with this term um, of OCCD, obsessive, no, DD, obsessive compulsional, obsessive compulsion delusional disorder. And that we like have a unremitting flow of thoughts that we feel like obsessively compelled to energize. And then delusionally, we think that they're like really all of them important. And it's so, and it's really, and this is where, when I was saying I felt humbled, you know, where we'll probably get to um, next time because they're building up to it, but there's a lot of moving around different themes and ideas in this book, but it always comes back to there is nothing you can do with the mind that is like a pot with a hole in it. And our mind that's constantly distracted is like a mind that it's like a pot with a hole. Like it just keeps flowing through. It doesn't matter how many teachings you get, it doesn't have what our workshops and da -da. like if we can't actually hold a mind sustained in attention, we can't do anything. And 
and it's so hard. And the improvements are subtle. And the more we notice our wandering mind, like then it's actually we really notice what a you know as as Thich Nhat Hanh says, as we notice what a garbage dump the mind is too, right? And so there's there's a can be a defeat. But just noticing the proliferation of worries ready to distract you is part of that process of developing the attentiveness of, you know, this is certainly not only true when we meditate. You know, our mind is populating whatever space is available with like this worry and that worry. And that. I mean, just, yeah, obsessive compulsional delusional disorder. And he's so uh, passionate about it. He like loves that. He finds it very clever. <laughs> But I think it's like the, you know, the obsessive compulsive part, like that we really think we need to think our thoughts. That part to me is, is kind of a, you know, part of mindfulness is tracking when this is happening. And the other part is like really clearly seeing this is delusional, right? Like I don't want to remember these worries in like five days. They're going to be like a whole new set. Right? Or the ones that are like still there, like I'm working on, and it's like just this idea of we have to. And what's so interesting, you know, I love this idea, I kind of cued this, but we, we think we're tired, I'm so tired, I can't meditate, but like we can still perseverate on all these thoughts. <laughs> so there's mental energy. It's just how do we like, how do we bring it back to this more subtle field and become interested um, bringing attention to where it's back there because that is that's what I don't feel uh, despondent and despair of like oh my god training the mind wow hardest thing ever <clears throat> and start to feel like oh yeah well all the ingredients are already here what feels so far away might actually be like right there and I think that's true like moment to moment in our practice you know, we fall away but then we're right there so, and it's great that you could you know keep coming back did it shift and change at all the sensations in the body? And were they were they pronounced too? Somewhere, yeah. 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 yeah and you know, you can make space for all those worries at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that this time especially in my coccyx, mm. like it went through all my spine mm. and uh, the pain, it started like little pain, mm. never got too bad. Yeah. Well, I realized that maybe that pain was there. Yeah. Mm. And the, the thing is that it came out yeah. because of the relaxation. Mm. Because that my mind was free of other things. Yeah. Mm. I was not thinking. Yeah. Which it's very difficult for me. Yes. Mm. And uh, so now what do, what do I do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You have the problem of relaxing the mind so you're aware of pain. And 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 did it change at all, the pain, or did it kind of stay or it it got worse. Yeah. And worse because I was really like going from the very top mm -hmm. to my coccyx. Yeah. And that's where uh, I know that I have I have many pains because I used to fail skiing and yeah. doing things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, which is, I mean, it, it, is, it is strange because you are, you are looking for getting better. Yeah. But it's wonderful that you can see where the things are. Yeah. So you can really, like, not getting, getting crazy when suddenly you're driving or yes. walking or. Yes. And you feel the pain. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like taking care and, and knowing and yeah. you know, knowing that you feel many times. Yeah. Pain or yes. Better. Yeah, and knowing that it might be the right time to sit up for a moment, to stand up even in practice and release. And or, you know, because 
there's this wonderful place where everyone's afraid to be. <laughs> like supine practice is so good. So lying with a pillow under the legs. You know, we don't, we don't want to feel like we're exacerbating, especially kind of like uh, repeated um, pain in the body. Um, and so it could be good to experiment with that and allow the mind to fully relax and allow the body to fully relax. Sometimes the pain will shift, right, with our attention on it, but we can, I think we kind of know the difference in our own body. So we have to be the ones to decide, like, I'm going to stay with this and see if there's like a relaxation that can happen around the pain, or I'm going to do a supine meditation, um, which I think is a, a wisdom posture in my point of view. Yes, Without absolutely. Yes, <laughs> no, supine is great. I did, yeah, I've done six months of supine when I had back injury, and it's like a, it's very powerful to train oneself to do. At first, we fall asleep a lot. Um, and so you can do something like you keep the hand up, because then when the hand is keeping you know, asleep. <laughs> but it's really such a gift to give ourselves supine practice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Who's next? Thank you. So similarly to our friend in the blue hat. Um, what is it? Ankit. Yeah. And your name? Eileen. Um, I was trying to decide on which <laughs> which dresser. And then, then getting lost in the story, and then wandering away, and then you had a cue of like how you know, how is that feeling in your body? And it seems really obvious. But I noticed that my posture it's like this. Yes. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, that, yes. that's really like easy body cue. Yeah. So then instead of like then instead of when before my mind started to wander, I felt my body start to go. And I was like, oh, there it is. Amazing. And so then I was like, I can bring it back because of the body cue. Yep. So awesome. Such a good noticing and like great for everybody to hear. So I think, I think Andre had his hand up back there. Yeah. Because um, I think it is like we do, you know, what you're highlighting is we do lose the body, right? When we're caught somewhere else, we lose it. And so then we're like, <laughs> Um, and there is this thing, like, it's, you know, especially our chin going down. So it's like really paying attention to the posture. Um, and with Fern, it's interesting because, you know, you'll be cued in meditation when you do a supine practice to even have the posture of vigilance even lying down, right? So that's not, doesn't, you can still have that uprightness. Vigilance has a bad connotation in our contemporary um, culture, but it's like vividness or awakeness. Kind of vigilance of our of our posture, um, so it's a really good noticing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the practice. Um, I wanted to ask about so how would you practice this with subtle stress or in what it causes? For example, like worrying about what happens to our planet, where it's not like worrying about Mother Nature and what about the planet, right? Where it's not a lot of thought content, like not a lot of rumination, like you don't necessarily ruminate all day, but, yeah. but it's still a very subtle and buried stress yeah. somewhere, so it's so hard to dig it up, or how, how would this practice go? And I couldn't hear you quite worrying about... The planet? Oh, that's not that subtle for some of us. <laughs> I think, well, I think my answer would be, it does help to kind of make it feel acute and relevant, so it would be, you know, like... Maybe it's saying it is distressing, but thinking of like birds covered in oil, you know, which is just one hallmarker of like what's wrong and letting that be the kind of spark to feel the, the acuteness of the worry, even though, you know, more generally the worry might be just kind of there. But I think the question also suggests like, yeah, how much, how many subtle layers of stress are we actually living in and you know when we do even half day or like longer practices we start to kind of feel that I think you know we kind of break through these different you know it just feels like there's all these cobwebs on the surface 
you know, it's like, oh my God, so much stuff. And then it's like, okay, ah. And it's like, next layer. <laughs> like, oh my God, all this stuff. <sighs> and then more. And, and it does feel like a, a purification process where things are rising to the surface to be released. So I, it's not a sign of like, man, my mind is so bad and so much worse. It's, and it, like we, you know, though there's no, like if I, I imagine like, don't think there's like a boundary on our awareness or our mind, but you know, I had to upgrade my iCloud storage space recently. Oh, and I was like, I don't know, sure, more. I don't know what this <laughs> seven billion emails I'll never read, but let's have more space for them. And I just think about like, there's gotta be like a capacity that we need to kind of clear out the inbox <laughs> of our mind, right? Of like all this stimulus and all these stories and all these experiences and then we're just piling more and more and more and it's interesting because i just said we don't want to be the pot with the hole in it then like what's that like we do want to do the is it marie condo we like kind of want to do that process and i think handshake is a really good handshake with motion practice is a really good like literally at the end of every day you know, way for us to kind of just, we don't have to think of one stressful thing, just sitting and being like, what is here? At that subtle emotional level in the body, what is here? And often the story arises, okay, story, what can I release in the body? Because we do, we need to kind of, you know, this also works super well journaling, right? We can journal just even 10 minutes, huge benefits we see, because yeah, it's full. Yeah. I love this practice. It's been, since starting to do it, I started realizing this thing that it still blows me away, which is uh, kind, of, kind of like in the movie Inception, when I'm in that mind state of stress, I am staggered by my ability to forget that the real world exists. Forget your dreaming. Like I'm in a yeah. dream, and I, like in the movie, they've got the object that yeah. they have that they use for dinosaurs they're dreaming. Sometimes I feel so far away from my body that I didn't have the body rescue me. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a question there. It's like, no, it's beautiful. Be practice, there's kind of ways we thought to that. Yeah, I mean, I do think these little, it's so funny, like there's so many, when you visit a monastery, I feel like there's so many subtle reminders to bring us back to that kind of awareness, you know, and, um, on my phone, I have a reminder like, are you dreaming? But then I forget because I've like seen it every day and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm dreaming, whatever. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> definitely dreaming, don't even realize. So like, how do we like keep fresh, you know, these like behavioral cues, honestly, to help us. And that might be that, you know, we're sitting and practicing and then we're sitting and practicing at night or um, we have friends we're checking in with. It's like, we just have to kind of, it's, actually not that hard to do these practices not necessarily easy it's just hard to remember as you're saying um, especially when we're really caught up so just yeah a lot of humbleness too thank you so i think we're gonna move on to a little content here um i wanted to yeah i wanted to um i wanted to read this this part here. <laughs> uh, we've, we've read this before, but it's, it's worth doing again. This is Shanti Deva, the 8th century um, teacher, and he says, tigers, lions, elephants, and bears, snakes, and every hostile beast, those who guard the prisoners in hell, all ghosts and ghouls, and every evil phantom, by simple binding of this mind alone, all of these things are likewise bound. By simple taming of this mind alone, all these things are likewise tamed. For all anxiety and fear, all sufferings in boundless measure, their source and wellspring is the mind itself. So just that idea that you know, our anxieties, our worries, not literally like you could meditate if there were bears and lions, but this idea that most of our concern, our anxiety, and our fear lives here in the mind itself. Um, 
And the way that Pema says it is that when we are present and awake, emotions have a short lifespan. But when we're unconscious, they can last for years. And so kind of, Andrea, to your point, that like subtle perpetuation in the background. Um, <laughs> so I find this funny, but. Um, and then Pema writes here, Shantideva uh, says explicitly that our hellish circumstances such as whips and the other horrors come from a hellish mind. In traditional teachings on the hell realms, the description of one particularly torturous state that we are is that we are continuously seduced up a hill made of razor sharp swords to reach our lover. Although we're cut to shreds, we keep climbing to the top only to have the sexy apparition turn into a devouring demon. <laughs> this happens over and over again. <laughs> so, such, I, guess, I, I guess you reconstitute it. Such suffering results from the out of court control craving of an extremely wanting mind. It starts as an, an ember, but quickly ignites into a full blown hell of insatiable desire. And this might seem like outrageous, but it's not, right? It's like really not. So does anybody know about that like climbing up the razor, the version of the, the razor hill towards this, what seems like will be the completion of our desires only to find ourselves like, wow, this actually makes me feel worse, but then the next day doing it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this, you know, so, so much is craving and, um, you know, often, and I know we've talked about this here, it's like this word addiction, craving, there's no difference between these terms. An insatiable desire, that craving, that hungry ghost, all of us, all the time. This is such a common, um, aspect of trying to you know feel better and avoid temporary pain and what's so what's so interesting is um there's a a friend of mine a researcher super impressive some of you may be familiar with his name um, judd brewer studies anxiety studies addiction and um i love i love a lot of the ways that in the last 15 years he's looked at addiction and craving through a buddhist lens he's a contemplative scientist and studies neuroscience of addiction especially and some of the ways that he talks about craving i think i've mentioned this here before is there's there's so much in the field of you know traditional addiction treatment of you just have to have the willpower to stop like just stop <laughs> Do you know how often that works? Like on a like literally a percentage? Does anybody know? Like the percentage? It's like two to five percent, right? For you know. I mean, if you have willpower, you can do it. Right. Like, so who's that person who walks in the office? And they're like, just stop. And they're like, oh my god! What are we? I didn't realize, you know. But yeah, two to five percent of the time, you know, people using like just stop for a week, stop, like just this kind of willpower. Um, and then his approach, Jensen Brewer, and also some of his great collaborators early on, um, Jack Davis and, and Joseph Goldstein, um, looking at these equivalencies in the Buddhist texts, and you see um, this idea that the Buddha sometimes shares in, in different suttas of see gratification to its end. So instead of, you know, exert willpower over your desire to have a cigarette, like really taste the cigarette. Not just your immediate hit of relief, but like the whole experience of what it's like. And he says the same is true for treating anxiety, right? So there's something about, you know, anxious thinking and anxiety based thinking that again, like I was saying, feels like productive. And there's this weird, you know, in, um, in contemporary psychology, you would call negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement. That's what gets us hooked, right? So I feel anxious, I'm gonna light a cigarette, and I feel better. It's positive reinforcement, right? And so over and over and over and over, we, we associate, but we're not paying like that close attention. Like how does it feel like when we go home and smell in our clothes? Or does it really feel like 
Is there like that, you know, back of the throat feeling with we smoking too many cigarettes or what's it like when we can't have a cigarette? Like seeing gratification to its end means really seeing like the full scope of what we're trying to do when we're avoiding pain or suffering or difficulty. Um, and that requires quite a lot of, of mindfulness. And it's interesting that, you know, when he was first doing this work, um, Judd and his colleagues, everyone's like, you're going to have people look closer at their craving and that's going to help. But part of it is developing this distress tolerance too. Like, what is it like to sit with the craving? And I know there's many um, deep practitioners in this room of like recovery based models and Buddhism and these ideas that actually we can kind of be with the distress and see that through, right? So not just see gratification to its end, like as we did in Handshake, like see the full experience of that squeeze, you know, that craving, that wanting. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's really it's really it's really helpful to to see. I mean, I I always love the data, and you know, these studies have been I, unbelievably successful. I mean, again, because the success rates are only five to two percent, that they can be ten times more successful is like it sounds impressive, but still, that's you know, yeah, not like everybody is benefiting, but so much more benefit to do these approaches where you're bringing in that clear seeing, like. What is this like? Gratification to its end, and also that distress tolerance, like learning how to be with the difficult, like turning towards the difficult. Um, and I, you know, I think it's very helpful to understand and, and talk about the the reality of craving. You know, it's something we're always saying in, in in Buddhist context of like, oh yeah, I mean that's samsara, right? And then we just kind of move on. But craving, you know, it just is, it's so vulnerable to really look at how deep that craving can be. To be liked, to be understood, to be held, to be successful, to be seen as good. Like, there's so many of these, like, kind of cravings that are just right there, that are absolutely underneath these behaviors and activities that take us away from ourselves. And they take us away from us, and they actually take us away from all of the bodhisattva work that we need to do for others. Right? Um, so it just be curious from folks, you know, how how this kind of idea or concept of craving, either in the Buddhist context or hearing it now, like how does that land for you, or what comes up? It's a really important one. Yeah. Well, what comes up for me when you were talking about, and, and whenever I hear the, the talking about turning towards our craving, turning towards our suffering, is the injunction about the first noble truth. The first noble truth is that life includes suffering. And the injunction is to understand the true nature of suffering. So that suggests that we're called upon to look at our suffering, to look at the causes, second noble truth, the causes of suffering, craving and clinging. Yep. We look at our craving and clinging and try to understand it mm -hmm. rather than just shutting down about it. Yeah. You know, grinding our teeth and saying, no, I'm not going to, you know. Yeah. But to, in my experience, with it is that when I've looked at my craving and clinging and in, a, in, in the recovery process from drug addiction, it was very important for me to look at the full spectrum of it, mm. of how it feels to me and what the results are in my life mm. and in the yeah. lives of the people around me and how that suffering ripples out. And, yeah. You know, having a, a, a true, a truer picture of it, but also to realize the other nature of suffering is that it's inevitable, so it's going to happen. It's not my fault. It's not because I'm doing it wrong. It's just inevitable. It's the it's the the, the nature of being alive. Mm. 
Therefore, it's impersonal. It's not just me. It's not my fault. And it's impermanent. Yeah. It passes away yeah. eventually. Yeah. All of my suffering, one way or the other, as I, if I have a looser grip on it and bearing down, it, it passes yeah. away. Yeah. And some other suffering comes up. It? But it also, it passes away. So beautifully said. Yeah, and it is like that moment, you know, we think of like giving in um, to our craving. And that could be, you know, we like to have sweets at night. Not that that relates to me. And we know it messes up our sleep. Um, <laughs> and you're just like, you know, you're, you're just, there's some like rationalization. There's some part of you that's looking away, right? It's so interesting. <laughs> that kind of self-deception <laughs> and then like there's the one of like succumbing to frustration and resentment you know like that's a different kind of craving of like i want to be right you know anyone ever had that <laughs> i get a long-term partnership and you're like i could say this thing or i could not say it and everything will go a lot better and you're like but i gotta say it <laughs> it's just unbelievable power that craving has on us, you know, to just like pull us under. And, you know, I think a big part of the practice is the clear seeing, like these noble truths, allowing us to clearly see, and then forgiveness, <clears throat> kindness, because we mess up every single day, right? Um, and so how to really, that, you know, that edge between, you know, last week, this discipline, the discipline of having attentiveness to the mind, really important to have the discipline, but also the kindness. You know? And most of you, because you decided to be here and not somewhere else, you probably are, have some level of good discipline. <laughs> and maybe it's the kindness and compassion that might be a harder, a harder one to strengthen, but they're both needed because it is, yeah, it is. I love the definition of balance, you know, being what happens when we fall one way and then we fall the other and then we fall one way and then we fall the other in the middle is balance. Not like, oh, it's this steady static place. We're coming into balance over and over with these practices. Anyone else on craving and addiction? Hot topics. Yes. Uh, over the years, I've noticed how, especially with meditation and meditating on hunger or like sleep, I used to get extreme cravings because of either of those. I would just go about and do whatever. And it's just like autopilot. Yeah. But like being able to live with, with the, the suffering of tired or hungry mm -hmm. has like slowly tampered my cravings. Mm -hmm. it's like it's like little bits of like oh I can I can deal with that pain. Right. It allows it to like allows me to open up to the, the different things. Mm -hmm. So I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's like a little bit of like that willpower to be able to slowly yeah. call it that. Yeah. yeah. So and and distress tolerance, right? Yeah. Within reason, right? We eat and sleep. Those are really important things. <laughs> but like to be, yeah, I mean, there is this kind of, um, and especially, you know, there's been research on this, under stress, we go for like higher fat foods, right? And not only that, but when we eat when we're stressed, it actually, the fat lands in a different place in our body. Like our whole metabolic system is different when we're stressed. So it's like, it's really um, interesting to think about that distress tolerance. It's like this huge key that can unlock for us uh, this choice of like how we want to be and how we want to respond. But we think of, and I love um, Jed Brewer, you know, has written about and talked about many times um, that you have to think of how many times you reinforce that habit of, you know, one-upping or um, eating late at night or whatever, like how many times you've reinforced it? Like how many years old are you? How many nights have there been? How many times? Have, and it's like, whoa, this is going to take a lot of, you know, digging. Yeah, a different pathway um, for it to become 
not just this exertion, but more a reflexive habit. And I've noticed, you know, the tea was like almond milk is almost as good as a Reese's peanut butter kind. <laughs> Actually, not Reese's, you know, the fancy organic kind, so I feel better about myself. But, you know, that kind of like, what is the reward and how can we, you know, shift our reward systems? Because the thing that Jed talks about a lot too is like a habit loop. That's the habit loop is samsara. Like, <laughs> so these are not new concepts, but that constant desire. And this is us shredding ourselves up the, the razor path towards, I'm going to feel so good. I just need this piece of chocolate. It's been such a hard day. And then, and then I can't sleep. You know, the demon eats me up or whatever. And then the next day I'm like, oh, it's been such a hard day. If I have some chocolate, it's like, what? what you just did that. We woke up, had chocolate late. You know, it's like, it's like we can't even see ourselves. It's so so tender, um, yeah, to, to see the tenderness um, for ourselves. And also, you know, as this text over and over and over reminds us, this isn't just about us sleeping well or being well. This is what is needed for us to make this world the world we want to live in. And even for us to make ourselves available for the possibility of having our heart open. And it's needed, you know, it's, I had the good fortune this morning to be on like a, a couple other teachers who I really admire and respect, kind of like a wisdom council. And we were talking a lot about the state of the world. And, um, you know, I was like, if you all were teaching tonight, how would you go about talking about the state of the world? I was like trying to get some hints and notes. <laughs> and they were like, we just keep teaching because like what else is more important than having our capacity for compassion um, sustained and strengthened and opened. And I think where we might fall into that despair or overwhelm or this is so hard or so many worries or so many cravings why we're doing it has to be front and center. So it's really important. Yes. I'm beginning to think of not bringing chocolate for you again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I'm struck by tonight is in the meditation as well of why it is so hard in terms of the craving to deal with our own perfection mm. and how to forgive that craving. Mm -hmm. That to me is a real piece of then why I'm constantly trying to get to the turn that really is never going to be the turn. Yeah. Because I'm always there and just who I am. Yes. This pursuit of perfectionism with one more thing, I think really asks of us how can we be tender and forgiving to ourselves. And yeah. When people come to you and they ask for forgiveness, yeah. Or helping you help them to forgive what they've done. Mm. It's been very striking to me to be with that and give them tenderness mm. in the seeking of perfection. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, the last part of the meditation, which nobody brought up, we're good on stresses and fears, <laughs> but basic goodness, like that that could be here or that is already here you know, that part two, so that we actually don't need to go for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it's so conditioned in us that our, our worth and our value is contingent upon more, right? As opposed to presence. And even when we know, like, wow, I did less today and I feel better. And achievement, this next thing I've achieved, it hasn't made very hard to to be with that and yeah need a lot of forgiving people to help us see it perfectionism you know i, I often don't associate myself with it because i don't like i don't need things to be like neat but when i think about perfectionism it's just like i need more i'm like oh yeah get it <laughs> right there's always a bigger next thing i'm gonna read one of my this is probably the most famous stanza in, in the whole book. And, you know, we think about this perpetual longing, desire, craving to feel okay. Um, 
and to be okay and to kind of make the world that we live in okay. And it's this kind of unending search, unending journey. And this stanza is um, to cover all the earth with sheets of hide. Where could such amounts of skin be found? But simply wrap some leather around your feet, and that's as if the whole world had been covered. Um, the analogy suggests, this is Pema here, that we've been walking barefoot over blazing hot sands, thorns and stones, and our feet are bruised and bleeding. Suddenly, we come up with a way to end our suffering. We'll cover the whole surface of the world with leather. This is, of course, impossible. But what if we wrapped leather around our feet? Then we could walk anywhere without a problem. Our problems can't be solved by eliminating each and every outer cause. Nevertheless, people everywhere take this approach. It's the world's fault. It's too rough. It's too sharp. It's too hard. If I could ri get rid of these outer things, I'd be happy. Shantideva says, if you want to protect your feet, wear shoes. And if you want to protect yourself from the world's provocations, tame your mind. The antidote to misery is to stay present. Uh, yeah. If only staying present was easier. <laughs> but I do find it very, yeah, just very inspiring. And so I would like us on that note to give ourselves a little time to dedicate the merit of this practice. So of course, we do this in every meditation, but especially when we're doing this guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. This, is, this feels comfortable and feels like an invitation. You know, these are considered to be vows. It's ways that we are dedicating ourselves over and over every day to becoming this warrior of compassion. So if it feels natural and comfortable placing the hands in front of the heart and offering, may I be an island for those who need landfall. May I be a lamp for those needing light. For those who are weary and tired, may I be a bed to rest. May I be both medicine and doctor for those who are sick, needing medicine. As long as space remains, so too shall I remain to alleviate the suffering of the world. And dedicating and considering if there's anything that's been stirred by our time here together, we offer up this energy with the outrageous hope that all beings of all time could know peace and ease, could feel love and belonging, that each and every being of all times could be free. on retreat next week. Yay! How loud of the mind. Um, <laughs> everyone's like, oh, it's so relaxing. I was like, have you been on retreat? <laughs> it's cool that you don't have to do dishes, but um, <laughs> so, so it's true. Sometimes you do. This one, Mount Madonna, they do the dishes. It's really nice. Um, but we have some amazing subs who will be coming um, next week and then the week after, all in person. So please um, come and enjoy amazing teachers. And we'll be kind of continuing on the theme of compassion and clearing the mind.